All right. Welcome on board, everybody. <clears throat> Got lots of people coming on board. So welcome, welcome, welcome today to, to today's special presentation, Creative Real Estate Investing Strategies. Dave, your hair looks great. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Guess pull that all the time, right, Dave? <laughs> That's right. With Mel and Dave Dupuis. So welcome on board, everybody. I see lots of people coming on. Just to make sure we got all systems go, please type in hi in the question box just to let us know we got the sound on, we got the video on. You can hear us, you can see us. So type just go ahead, type hi in the question box, and then where you're calling in from, and maybe what the weather's looking like outside. Kind of sunny, cloudy, and rainy all at the same time here in Kamloops. All right, so we got Katarzyna. Oh my goodness, Katarzyna, welcome, Glenn, Rick, Rick's Overcast. Where are you based again, Rick? Let us know where you're based. So come on, you guys. Lots more people on there. So evidently our audio is working. But go ahead, type in where you're calling in from. I see lots of people. Mr. St. Jean, good to see you, my friend. Beverly, Brad, Brad, Kathy, Cheryl, Craig, Daniel, Derek, uh, Doug. Hey, Doug. Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Good to see you. Janice. All right. Lona. Hey, good to see you, Lona. Marcus, good to see you, everybody. Just a shout out to everybody. Everybody. Everybody's calling in all the way from the Philippines. So welcome. 100% sunny in Montreal. Of course, awesome. All right, you guys, welcome. I got it. We're at the top of the hour. Pitter patter. Let's get at her. My name's Dave Debo. It's my pleasure to be putting on this presentation tonight with our two special guest presenters, Mel and Dave Dupuy. And Mel and Dave, welcome to the presentation tonight. How are you guys doing? Hello, hello. We are great. How are you? We're doing well. Excellent. Excellent. Better now that you're on the line and we got our Techie stuff all figured out. It's just going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation because you guys, this is all about creative strategies, how to get into real estate deals with little or none of your own money. Uh, this, this takes me back to the days when I first got started um, doing real estate investing back in 2003. I took a course from Ron Legrand how to get into real estate with little or no money, because that's exactly what I had. <laughs> so it was kind of good, but um, you know, I've heard and I've seen what Mel and Dave are doing, and it's so much better, so much smarter than I, what I was doing, because they're starting to get into doing no money down deals with multifamily properties. And they've, they've, they did 12 deals in 12 months with none of their own money. So. These guys definitely know what they're talking about. They've got over 100 units in their portfolio. They both quit a couple of those good, high-paying government jobs, walked away from the cushy job, the cushy salary, and the cushy pension, and decided to become full-time real estate entrepreneurs. They are investors, mentors, authors, and award winners. My goodness, that's quite, quite the lineup there, you guys. So again, welcome. Thank you very much. And I'm going to let you guys take it away. I'll be in the background. I'll turn off my webcam. Nobody needs to see me. And you guys take it away. And then you guys, if you got questions, go ahead, type them in the question box. We're going to open up for Q&A at the end of the presentation, just so these guys can, can get through in a timely fashion. And then we'll stick around as long as you want for Q&A. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I didn't ask you guys that. Hopefully, you're okay if we stick around as long as they want for Q&A. Absolutely. We love questions. We love Q&A. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So welcome, you guys. Thank you for so much for coming on tonight. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having us on, Dave. Yes. Thanks, Dave. My pleasure. Great. So thank you to everyone as well uh, for, for coming and, and listening to our presentation today. Um, we're going to have some great conversations. We're going to pass along a lot of tips. And uh, absolutely, we'll stick around at the end as well for some Q&A. That's often where the best conversation takes place. Yeah, it's, uh, I agree. It's a great question. So we love Q&A. Uh, so looking forward to that as well. So um, thank you, Dave, for the lovely introduction. Um, as Dave mentioned, uh, we specialize in buying properties using none of our own money. And what's very unique about Dave and I is that we solely own all of our properties. So 
Those are not joint ventures, which means that we get to keep 100% of the appreciation of the equity and the cash flow as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's what we'll go through. We'll kind of show you some different strategies on that. And uh, yeah, that's where we differ from the others is, is we don't, you know, we're not joint ventures. Uh, we solely own everything that we own, everything in our portfolio. Yes. And that's something people told us, well, you can't grow without joint ventures. We heard that a lot. Of, and for us, and we have nothing against joint ventures, of course. No, no, but, um, but it was just, we really wanted to solely own our properties. So we really wanted to build that, you know, generational wealth. And uh, once we discovered the, the power of creative financing, that's when it uh, changed our lives. So let's get right into it. So as you can see here, you plus act plus knowledge plus action equals limitless. And that's exactly what you are. You are limitless. So whether you don't know you have one property, five properties, no properties yet, it doesn't matter. The point is that you you just need the information, then you need to take action and you become limitless. Yes, and some well, what we notice is people will either have you know all the knowledge, but then they're they're too scared to take action, or some people will just dive in, take the action, but they don't have that knowledge base. So truly, you know, the you plus the knowledge plus the action, uh, that's what's necessary to truly be limitless. Yeah. Now let's start off with excuses, and uh, we're <laughs> going to get right into the creative financing soon enough. But we need to have, to set a few things straight because. Um, often people will take the tips from creative financing and they won't have the next few slides um, down. So we want to spend a little bit of, of time on here and then we'll talk about the creative financing. Um, but excuses are lies we tell ourselves. And this is the opportunity tonight to really, really be honest with yourself. Yes. You know, you're, you're maybe home alone or home with somebody else. Um, you decided to book this call for a reason. You decided to jump on this call for a reason. So think about, you know, be honest with yourself with some excuses. We'll, we'll touch about the most common ones that we've heard or that we used to make ourselves about excuses. Excuses are lies that we tell ourselves not to move forward. So one excuse that we hear all the time is market, right? Well, I live in a very hot market or, you know, I'm in the secondary market. There's no rental properties here. Um, and yeah, I can't buy properties, hence, in, in wherever I'm living in. And we're here to say that it's 100% false. So we we are ourselves in the secondary market. We have mentees across North America, Absolutely. actually, in, in hot markets, right? Like Toronto, uh, Miami, California, uh, BC, Montreal, where else? Ottawa, <laughs> yeah. um, where else? Atlanta, <laughs> yeah. Boston, yeah, Miami, like Mel said. So again, guys, it's doable. And, and there's deals everywhere. And if someone says it can't be done here or... Uh, there's just no deals in my market. You know that that that's an excuse. There are deals everywhere, um, so that's don't let that be your excuse. Yeah. And and so the no time. That's the second biggest one we hear. And um, again, everyone only has 24 hours in a day. Like Mel and I don't have any more time than you do. No one else has any more secret formula on that. It's just you need to truly carve out your day and create more time. Uh, Mel and I had three kids when we did when we did the 12 and 12 we had full-time jobs this was all side hustle yeah they were young too like my yeah. our youngest was only two years Here's old two. when he bought the, the 12 and 12 yeah. and that's 56 units so we grew very quickly in the number of apartments as well yeah and if you think about it so okay we had a set day right uh kids would everyone would get up at 6 or 6 30 let's say and everyone would go to bed at you know 8 8 30. So that was, we could never change that schedule, right? The kids, it is what it is. But you can change what time you go to bed. Uh, we're not night people. <laughs> so as soon as they went to bed, we would go to bed. Yeah. But you can truly control what time you're going to get up in the morning. You're going to get up at 4 a.m., you're going to get up at 5. That's where you're going to create your time. So the whole no time, don't let that be an excuse that's a barrier to, to your goals, guys. Yeah. And, yeah. and Yeah, and sorry, I'll catch you off there. And the other thing, too, is... What are you doing with the time that you do have? When in that in those uh, when we sorry when we purchased the twelve properties in twelve months, you know we decided you know we used to kind of sit down every night watch Netflix. We had a couple of favorite shows and watch a season here and there. And but when we truly said time is not going to be an issue, no more Netflix, no more favorite shows. We con conscience consciously conscience, yeah. we stopped it all. The only TV we ever still pretty much watch today. Is with the kids. Right? Disney, movies. Had Disney movies, movie night with pizza, that kind of thing with the kiddos to involve them. Uh, other than that, no, we're, you know, we, we find that balance. So time, right? Create that time for yourself. 
um, can't find deals. Again, there's deals everywhere. Absolutely. Just because you didn't find them doesn't mean they're not out there. Maybe you don't know where to look. Maybe you don't have the right resources. Maybe you don't know the different tricks that we've been able to use to really grow, right? So there are deals in every single area. You just have to know how to find them. Yeah, and, and the next one, lenders as well. So can't find deals, can't find lenders. Uh, again, you have to look, you have to think outside the box. And that's what Mel and I did. We started reverse engineering and we're truly approaching sellers, lenders, uh, in different outside the box thinking. And again, guys, yes, it's happening in your market or yes, it's happening in whatever market you want to invest in. Yeah, and we have lenders across Canada. So some are not even in our province. You know, they're in different provinces. Um, they don't see the properties we buy, right? So there are private lenders everywhere. Yeah. Again, you may not know how to find them, so it's, it, but they are out there working full time. Like they've said, you know, we're both working full time when we bought the 12 and 12, and we had three kids at home. So that kind of touches on the, the second <laughs> last point there. Now, COVID-19, of course, with everything going on, unfortunately with, in the world right now, um, a lot of people certainly use this as an excuse. They say, well, I'm interested, but I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm gonna wait and see what happens. Um, and, and I mean, obviously it is a personal choice. Dave and I, we are certainly proactive. Yes. Um, we have proper systems and strategies in place, but we are continuing to, to look and to purchase. We have four properties right now under contract. The my, lawyer's drafting one, yeah, yes, drafting one up today. Here. My, uh, my daughter really wants a course and we said, well, we're not paying for it. Proper, <laughs> property will pay for it though. So we're in the middle of uh, helping her buy her first property at 14 years old. So that's under contract now. I know he was going no, to yeah, the, the lawyer, lawyers. They have to, to know, yeah, some info. So that'll be tomorrow. It'll be under contract tomorrow. So there you go. So <laughs> There'll anyhow. be some horse money. Yeah, so we're, anyhow, so we're moving things along um, as well. So we're not certainly using that no. as an excuse. But yes, we are doing our due diligence. Okay, so now back to you. What are your goals? What are your 2020 goals? Your 2025 goals? Your 2030 goals? Now I really challenge you to take a second and write them down. So right? pull out a piece of paper or put it in your notes, at least on in your phone. Don't get distracted though. Stick, <laughs> stick to the webinar because there's a lot of great information. But seriously though, writing down your goal is huge. Um, it makes a difference. We are huge, huge believers in that. If you study any highly successful person, you know, most of them, everyone I know, they've all done some kind of goal writing. So set your goals, you know, what can it be? Maybe today, Maybe this year it's buying one property or two properties, or maybe it's uh, in five years from now to quit your full-time job or to be there for your elderly parents. Or I mean, my goal was to one of my goals was to stop hating Mondays because I hated <laughs> I used to hate Mondays and I knew that meant I have to quit my job. And I also wanted to see my little five-year-old, you know, back then he was younger. I wanted to see him get on and off the school bus every day. Um, so that was one of my goals. So think about yourself. What are your goals? What are you reaching for? Yeah, and if you don't have a goal, again, you're when you know what you're working towards, right? You're kind of just going aimlessly. So you know, the 2030. Think of what you want, and we're big on reverse engineering. So re reverse engineer what you need to do. You know, to so by 2025, what do you need to have achieved or done to start meeting your 2030 goal? And again, the 2020 is the, I find the most important. What are you going to do this year? Uh, in order to get on the right path to meet that 2030 goal. So reverse engineer and really break it down and start doing, you know, day to day, the actions that you need to get towards that 2030 goal. So yeah, setting goals, very important. Good. So as you know, Dave and I, we bought 12 properties in less than 12 months. So I, I own two properties before I met Dave, so that's why I'm here alone here. So I have one property <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, that equals one week of my pay. So I actually did the cash calculation. The cash flow from that property was equaling what I would bring net a week, one property. And then I thought to myself, well, wait a second, if I do two of them, then I'm gonna have, it's gonna cover two weeks of my pay. So then met Dave and then we talked about our goals and decided, wait a second, if I, or if we buy together, 12 properties, right? That all of a sudden there goes more than what I'm making for sure. And then some, my monthly income. But again, reverse engineer what we needed, right? Exactly. So that's when we decided to do it, right? We had that big goal. So then we set our goals. We did write it down. Hope you wrote your, down, your goals as well. We decided to buy 12 properties in less than 12 months and we did. And that was 56 units solely owned, a hundred percent in our name. And no money down. No money down. Yes. Most importantly. All right. So how did we get there? 
we had to make sure that we really have the right to wrap our around, mind around good debt versus bad debt. And this is a big one. If you're not there yet, it's such an important one to grasp your mind around it because it's almost reversing what we've been taught pretty much our entire lives, yeah. or at least the majority of us. Um, so like, yeah, go ahead, Dave. And during COVID, we've been kind of uh, getting the kids to look at debt differently, right? They, you know, we've asked them, what do you think, is debt good or bad? And they're like, oh my gosh, it's bad. And, and it's educating them, right? So even, we haven't, we try not to talk too much about things just yet because they're younger, but more and more we're integrating them into this. So good debt versus bad debt. Um, and you'll see the pictures are pretty clear. So the one on the left under good debt. So this person literally has money falling out of their pocket, right? And what we, what we teach people is, again, good debt. So what do you want? You want income producing debt. And obviously we're real estate people. So income producing assets puts the money in your pocket, okay? And again, I know this sounds very simple, guys, but you have to have this, this mentality and, and this way of thinking if you want to use debt properly. Now, on the, uh, on the right side, uh, bad debt, obviously, he's got the, the double fork there. <laughs> but literally, that person is carrying that car or that vehicle on their backs. Uh, and I love the, the bag of money, like they're shackled to that, right? So they literally go to work every day to pay for that vehicle or pay for that asset, whatever that asset tends to be. Meanwhile, the person on the left is putting money in their pocket from the asset. So again, guys, it's so powerful once you understand you know, debt is not a bad thing if used properly. Yeah, that's actually how we opened up our uh, book. our book was uh, shackled and how we're, you know, we used to, well, we used to be shackled in the job. We were kind of, they, oh, you know, it was the jail, right? You had to go and you were stuck there. Um, and and with, with real estate investing, we we're able to, to break away from that. All right, so the bigger the debt, the richer I get. And I just love <laughs> this chart because it makes, now to me, it makes, so much sense and it sounds crazy but it's not and let us explain so i always say the richer or the more debt i get you know the richer i'm getting and look at the debt and you can see so look, you know let's take the one on the on the right side here so at the beginning i didn't have necessarily a lot of rentals i didn't have a lot of debt now when i say debt it's all good debt right <laughs> remember the previous slide it's not because it's all boats and fancy cars here it's good debt so the more good debt i would get my income kept increasing because it was making more money than what I was actually bringing out, right? So it was bringing in more money than my expenses. I was left with with a leftover every single time, right? So the more debt I have, that good debt is making me money and my wealth is continuing to grow. Yeah, so it really correlates, right? And an example I'd like to say to these numbers is when we started out, you know, uh, we had $3 million of more, sorry, $3 million of mortgage debt. Right, again, good debt, mortgages that are paying me money every month. Uh, so that being said, our wealth was you know, in correlation with the debt. The debt was there and the wealth was here. And now we have over $10 million of bank debt, right? So it kind of just, same thing. The debt keeps going higher. I hope to have $100 million of debt one day because that means my wealth is going gonna, is gonna to keep climbing with that as well. So just a concept that we like to, to kind of show again. That is good if properly. Yes. So now the power of leveraging, and then we'll get right into the creative financing. So leveraging, so leveraging debt, leveraging money, leveraging time, and debt. Um, I know you always say refer to it more like a mortgage, right? Yeah. Like a, the, the, the way I see this is is the power of leveraging. When I see debt, I, I immediately think uh, financial institution. You know, I think of a mortgage. They're giving me debt, and I'm leveraging you know, that debt to purchase, right? So if I find a, a multi-unit family dwelling, depending on the number on the size, 75 or 80% loan to value. So I'm going to be leveraging that debt from the bank to purchase my asset, which is going to pay me money every month. So again, you're using the bank's money to buy something that's going to pay you every month. It's a beautiful thing. Now the money, the way I see that is, I see that as like private lenders, uh, investors, you know, they have money, they have uh, liquidity, they have, let's say their RSPs, a uh, line of credit, the refinance. Now they're going to take that money, they're going to invest in you uh, through real estate. And, and again, you're taking their money to buy your asset to make you money. But on the other side, and what I love about the debt and the money is the bank. The bank is leveraging you, right? They find an investor, they give them uh, uh, you know, a mortgage and they get interest. So it, it's, it's a win-win. And same with the other money. Um, Again, the private lender is investing through you. You're paying them interest. Win-win. 
and, and the time. Yeah, and for the time, time, I mean, we leverage time all the time. That's how people ask us, how are you guys able to do it? Three kids, two dogs, um, you know, over 100 units. How do you do it? Well, it's leveraging time. So we have, for example, we have two virtual assistants. We have a property management company, you know, our gym, our director. We have a construction team, a construction manager, maintenance team. We have a marketing director. We have a financial controller. So there's a lot of people who are part of our team. We have a mentorship um, manager as well, who's uh, recently joined our team, right? So our, our team is continuously growing. And every time we do, we love it because all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, I just created an extra 40 hours for myself here, an extra 40 hours. And think about how many people we have as part of our team, how many extra 40 hours we would just create yeah. for ourselves. Now, if you're thinking, well, wait, Mal, I, I don't even own a property yet. Don't worry, I get it. We've been there. We, you know, we were not, we came, did not come from a rich family. We did this from the ground up. Um, so I hear you. And at the beginning, we did everything ourselves. You are everything. Come yeah, we are. You are everything, right? You're the. You take the phone calls. You're the. You're the qualified plumber. Yeah. <laughs> but it keeps the cost low exactly. at the start. So. But it is possible as you grow that you, you know, you, you learn to to leverage time. All right. Creative financing. Now, to keep it simple for tonight, there's so many different ways. You see, there's six creative financing strategies, but there really is so many more because you can anyhow intertwine each different ones. But for, to keep it super simple for tonight, we divide it into two. So the first one we'll talk about is owner financing. So picture this as being Mrs. Owner. So she actually owns this property. So she's tied directly with the house. She wants to sell it. So you know, she 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 she's owning it right now. She wants to sell it, and by it's doing so, she will be removed. So she won't be on mortgage, but she's still connected at first to the actual mortgage itself, or to the actual property itself. And there's three different ways that you can create a win-win partnership with them. And again, there's not a joint venture. It's going to still be 100% your name, uh, but you can actually ask Mr. or Mrs. Owner to hold 100% finance of the property. There's an option here. Or it can be also first mortgage. The first mortgage um, would be, let's say, 80% of the value. Or you can get her to hold the second mortgage. Second mortgage is known, there's different terms out there. Uh, second mortgage, uh, owner financing, seller financing, vendor take back, or VTB. These are all the same terms. And essentially, it's we use it as a down payment. So it typically would be the 20 or 25 percent down that you would go in. So in that case, you know, we we use um, a financial institution to hold the, the first mortgage and then the second mortgage as the VTB. That's quite yeah. often the most popular way. And, that we and do. we're we're gonna have examples guys of, of you know case studies of what we've done. So uh, yes we'll show you the first so you, if you're thinking Mal you lost me don't worry don't we're worry. gonna explain it and we'll we're show gonna show you if you're real, visual like yeah. you need to see it. Yeah we'll show you some real life uh, I think we have a few examples today. Yeah. So this one, okay, so this is private lending. So the way I like to look at it is the last page, that is when the owner, uh, seller is truly going to be participating in, in financing the deal, okay? So that, that was that section. This section, private lending, is gonna be someone who uh, has never owned the property, has no interest or anything in the property, but they will uh, assist in financing as well. So the first one is with secured, uh, secured funding. So, for example, RRSP in the States, that's equivalent to your 401k. Uh, if you want to do TFSA, that type of thing. So, with this, the private lending, the RRSP has to be secured with the mortgage. So, there's a th third-party agency that allows you to take someone else's RRSP, right, has to be arm's length, and utilize that as a mortgage. So, that, uh, yeah, that's an attractive way for people with the RRSPs to, to invest into real estate as well, passively. Now, the other two examples there are going to be if someone has, you know, cash, a line of credit, if they just refinanced a place, um, but, you know, funds that are not secured, right? Like an RSP where you can't just take it out unless, unless you pay a big penalty on it. So the first example there, if you have something like cash, is a promissory note, which is basically a contractual agreement um, with you and, and the private lender stating that, you know, they're going to lend you X amount of dollars to do, you know, this with. Uh, here's the interest. Here's the term. Here's all the you know, all the all the, uh, uh, the specs of the deal. So they could do a contractual agreement with you, or the, or the other option is they can also do a mortgage. They can say, hey, you know, I want to put a mortgage on this property. 
Um, and same thing as with the RSPs, they can do that with uh, with cash. But there'll be a little more lawyer uh, interaction there. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, let's get to the examples. Let's get, let's get to the examples. So let's start off with a six unit uh, property that we purchased. Um, love this property, it's a nice, nice big yeah, and sorry, Mel, I just want to say that because some people always say, well, okay, the purchase price and that. So again, guys, don't get stuck on the price and the numbers because it fluctuates, you know, it, it correlates with the market you're in. Uh, so don't get stuck on the actual purchase price. Just look at the example. And yes, the don't make that excuse. Well, I'll never find a property in my place for, you know, know. for that because that's usually the number one the excuse hot markets, people yeah. in the hot markets. But you might not find this, but we're also not going to have as much appreciation. So there's lots of different things. To, to uh, oh, yeah, it, right? look at the actual example. Yeah, all right. So, purchase <laughs> price good point, Dave. So, purchase price $575,000. Nice brick apartment. Now, in this case, it was a, a um, lovely lady who, uh, and, and that's the actual picture here. You can see her company's logo there, the property management logo. Um, so, yeah, so in this case, uh, Mrs. Seller um, recently lost her husband. And she, it was the building that her husband built it, didn't she? Didn't yeah, they? him yeah. and her brother built it with their own, uh, their own hands. Yes. Now that being said, she was not involved. It wasn't her passion. It was her husband's passion. So when he sadly passed away, um, she didn't no longer wanted it. She just wanted to, you know, to to move herself from it. She didn't want it anymore. So Dave and I, we went up to her and we discussed creative financing, and we asked her if she would be open to creative financing, and she said yes. So. This is what we were able to do. The first mortgage, we went to a financial institution and they held the first mortgage of, and I'm just going to round off here, $430,000. Then Mrs. Owner, who is now Mrs. Seller, so she's not attached no longer, she's essentially the second mortgage. So she's lending us $143,000. So that way I'm not putting any of my own money into the deal itself. It's 100% <laughs> financed. Now, this was an underperforming property, and people will often say, well, if it's just underperforming, why would somebody ever let it go for 575 If, As you can see here, the appraisal price is 840 Well, the reason it sold for 575 is because it was worth 575 because it was underperforming. It was at that level. Rents were very, very low. They always let them go, you know, they, and, and some people are completely fine with that, right? They just wanted long-term tenants. There was one of the units that was... Uh, that needed to be done so we did put a little bit of money in total um and it needed some fire retrofits just some minor fire retrofits so in total we spent about what, thirty thousand dollars or yeah, so 20 for the unit and let's say 10 ish for the fire retrofit yeah so in overall we, we paid that and i know it's not part of the calculations but it's also the the monthly cash flow of how much was it back then we started 1500 or so so uh, yeah monthly cash flow so you know it all kind of evens out so we just put these numbers to keep it super simple um in general, to show you the example. Okay, so she held the second mortgage appraised for 840. So our lip, we love that word, our, our lip, we're able to force appreciation by $265,000. So we went back, financial institution, and we got a new mortgage for $714,000. Now that means that the 431 is gone, the 143 is gone, and that leaves us with a profit of 139 thousand dollars of tax free yes it's tax free when you refinance with zero money into the deal now think about how powerful that is because people think about oh you know i made 20 percent or oh, i made 25 percent and yes 25 percent it is amazing but we go in and it's infinite we put in zero dollars in here and it's infinite return on that money yeah and just to kind of give you some some idea all six units there guys were underperforming so you know like these you see four units here they're all three bedrooms that were rented for i think roughly a thousand dollars and the market rent for three bedrooms here is somewhere between like 15 to 1650. so that's a substantial difference right so now we've got we up the rent in five out of the six units right so that's what gave us the the massive lift was when uh, the appraisal company and it was one of the the national appraisal companies came from ottawa they did it and they saw the difference in the rent. So they were able to appraise uh, for that uh, that amount. Now, the other thing too, is if you're doing some math, you're thinking, hey, you guys made a mistake. The first mortgage of 714, that's actually, they gave us 85% loan to value. So we brought this one to CMHC Financing, Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation, which is some of the hardest financing to get, right? Because they insure the mortgage. They, they 
put us through the ringer, right? Dot the I's, cross the T's. So that's why you're seeing 714 because they gave us 85% loan to value. So that's again, like Mel had said, guys, that's a refinance. And in there, you're not seeing like, like this, the mortgage was obviously less than this and this when we paid it out, but keeping it easy and truly we got a big refinance on it tax-free. So again, purchase the building with none of our own money, pay back the, you know, the private, uh, well, the, the vendor take back, still have the asset, still cash flows every month. You get a, a very sexy refinance and now the return on investment is infinite. So that's why I love doing yeah, it. Yeah, so way. that was one of the 12 that we purchased. The yeah, that's right. That was one of the 12, yeah. 12. We just repaid them uh, about a couple of months ago. Now that being no, said, that, during we, the COVID. Yeah, during the COVID, we we repaid. Uh, we had repaid the eight of them. We all repaid all eight of them back um, within two to three years. Although we had five-year terms, so they were all paid off early. Um, and we'll get to that on how we did that in a little bit here. Now let's go with example number two. So example number two is a 17-unit property. Uh, purchase price is 1.5 million. Um, again, the first mortgage, we went to the financial institution. Second mortgage, the owner had equity, so he decided you know, to, to deal directly with us, help us out. We made it a win-win, and he held a second mortgage of $381,000. Once again, this property was a nice property, uh, but the rents were so low. Like As soon as we saw the numbers, we were like, oh my gosh, like we just knew, right? We knew because we look at a lot of properties to know when it's these types of properties sent out, right? So you're not going to find them on every single year. You're going to have to look at different deals, of course. Um, but this one was highly underperforming. So um, we did what we do. We forced the appreciation by, you know, there was a couple units that needed mine really just paint, yeah. but they were pretty much all, they looked great. Uh, nice countertop, nice uh, kitchens and cabinetry and everything. Uh, so our lift, for this property, $415,000. So once again, took a mortgage of $1,649,000. We paid off first mortgage, paid off the second mortgage. Again, that was seller financing or owner financing or BTB, again, whatever you want to call it. And we were left with a profit of $124,000. Yeah, and this one again, all 17 units were underperforming, right? You know, uh, and when we went in, we bought it. Um, I think we made like $500 profit on a 17 unit building initially, right? Still fully financed and still profiting. So we were able to up the rents, you know, as tenants moved out and, and tenant changeover. I think we, we got six or seven of the units uh, up to market rent. So we had increased the rents by just over $2,000 a month. So $24,000 a year. You know that'll do a, that alone in our cash flow as well right absolutely so that guys on your net operating income you know for the appraisal to come in increasing the rent by two grand a month is it, substantial right so the appraisal company came in again appraised at a 1.94 um, and the first mortgage once again cmhc financing 85 percent loan to value um and there we are so this again this was one of the deals that was financed through covid uh, it was roughly a $4 million refinance that we did, and, and the last two were part of this one, and the last one were part of it. Um, but again, now, zero money in, pay the second mortgage out. Now we have a refinance, infinite return on investment. And this one, guys, just to clarify the first and second mortgage, okay? So the first mortgage, um, we went to a credit union. Credit unions have a lot more flexible financing. They allow second mortgages, because I know that's going to be a question coming up in the questions. So credit unions, so typically the big five banks don't do this, right? That's why, you know, once we were done getting the lift, that's when we brought it to one of the big five to get the, the CMHC finance or an A lender to get that. Now the second mortgage, so the, the seller still had a first mortgage, right? So that's why if you have a first mortgage, you know, you can't give someone else a first mortgage because the bank is always in the first. Uh, but he basically took the equity that he had in the deal and instead of getting, you know, on closing, he got this, the 1.1. And instead of getting the 381 on closing, he literally changes that equity and flips it into a mortgage for us, uh, which again, he's getting interest on. Why, why would the seller do this? He's getting interest on it. And now in that one year, he's only going to pay tax on the 1.1 instead of the 1.5. So this is why sellers like this. Again, they, they don't just do it because they, they want to, you know, from the bottom of their heart, they're doing it because it's going to help them as well. They're going to pay, 
the less of a tax hit in the first year, and then they get to spread the love over five years while making interest on it. So again, guys, there, there's a there's a method to the the madness here. Absolutely right. They don't they do it for a reason, so it benefits them as well. Now, example number three, we wanted to include this one in, so it's a little it's a little different structure, um, and again, want to show you the different ways that you can actually buy it. So we bought this uh, beautiful pot unit. <laughs> Salmon uh, pink. Yeah, salmon pink needs a little bit of TLC, a uh, five unit. Uh, so the first purchase price was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now this property was listed. Was it almost a year? It was just shy of a year. Yeah, yeah. It was shy of a year. So, yeah. Yeah. About ten months on market. Nobody was buying it. Because, yeah, because it was it was an underperforming. And when you did the numbers, the numbers didn't really make sense. But it was underperforming. We saw a huge potential. But we knew that in this case, a, a financial institution, because we underwrite deals the same way the banks would, we underwrite it before even go to financial institution, yeah. we knew right away that, you know, you're not going to get this building sold. And there's a reason why it's on the market. Yeah, absolutely. The bank has certain ratios and this just didn't fit the ratio. So like Mel said, no bank would approve it because whether you came in with a 20% down payment or not, the ratios just aren't there. Yes. Yeah, so we went up to Mr. Seller, <laughs> we brought with us our cash flow matrix, and then we showed them. We said, Look, we underwrite deals the same way this bank would. You can see it here. This is how your property is performing today, and there's no way that the prop that you're going to be able to get it approved. So, unless somebody's coming in with $250,000 cash, which is rare, um, you're not going to be able to anybody can go in. And it's not really about us here, it's about the financial institution is not going to approve the property itself. So, Mr. Um, Owner finance or seller financing, he decided to take our numbers, he looked at it, and we also showed him because we always show our exit strategy as well on how we were going to pay him back. He decided that, you know what, you're right, it makes sense. Um, let's make it a win win. I want to sell my property. You're willing to help me out as well by buying it and not going to a financial institution. So, in this case, he actually became our first mortgage. So he was mortgage free. That's that's how he was yes, able to do he, this. Yes, he had to be mortgage free. And this one was it was eighty or eighty five, eighty or uh, seventy five. Yeah, eighty eighty percent loan. Eighty percent. Okay. So which, sorry, my loan to Jack. Yep. Which again, you're going to say, Dave, how come you got eighty percent loan to value? Because you know, if it's five units and over, that's commercial financing. If it's four units and under, it's residential. Residential, they go up to eighty percent. Commercial, they go up to seventy five percent. Now, that being said, there is no bank here. So Mr. Seller let, the, let us go up to 80% on a five unit building because he's making up the rules. We're making up the rules. It isn't a financial institution. Yes, we could have went 100% here. And we've done that before as well on different deals. Um, okay, so he held 80% here. The second mortgage, we actually got Mrs. RRSPs to hold that portion of the second mortgage. So yes, you can use your own or some well you can't use your own to buy your own I property wish. i wish <laughs> uh, but you can use somebody else's rsps to fund the deal so that's exactly what we did so this uh this um our mrs rsp she's from a different province she's never seen the property so again when you say if you're using well i don't know anybody well i never knew her until we took the steps and reached out to people either um but she held 50 percent of the deal so 50 percent uh RSP went towards the second mortgage. Then the appraisal is five hundred thousand dollars. So the lift is huge, two hundred fifty thousand dollars here. So again, we paid off the first mortgage, pay off Mrs. RSPs, and then there's a hundred twenty-five thousand dollars left. Once again, tax-free with zero dollars, none of our own money. That's how we scale. That's how we now own over hundred units. There's no way we could have done it unless we had joint ventures or unless we came from a super rich family, which we, you know, we don't. Um, so that's the power of creative financing. Yes, absolutely. And guys, again, this deal, I know you're saying, Dave, it's it's not attractive. Let's like the building itself, let's not lie. <laughs> so, you know, painting, siding, couple new windows, that type of thing. You know what? Other than that, but it's if this is a flat roof, it's a Brand new flat roof with membrane uh, uh, roofing, so that's that expense is gone. That's not happening for a while. Um, and then everything in the units were just a minor TLC, a countertop here and there, a coat of paint. So it was just low rents that was the major issue here. And when you find these buildings, guys, it's you know now we have a cash flowing asset for the rest of our you know we're going to pass it off to our kids, generational wealth. 
with no money into it. So finding the, these types of deals is key and then creative financing them. Um, it's just an amazing thing. Oh, and that one I forgot to say. Oh, let's go back. This one was not CMHC financing. So the first mortgage of 375 is 75%. Just in case you're saying, well, how come this one isn't? Yeah. <laughs> Full disclosure. All right. Now we're going to say stop. All right. This is part of the probably one of the most important slides of the presentation. Um, so I'm glad that you're sticking around for it. You got to stop right here. You got to exit before you enter. And I'll say that again. Exit before you enter. This is by far the biggest mistake that people make is they don't know how to exit the deal. They talk the talk or they'll rush into it or they're going to get owner financing opportunity and they're going to say, oh my gosh, I can, you know, a 0% down deal. They'll get excited. And we've been there before, you know, you want to jump on it, but then wait a second, you have to make sure that you know how you're going to pay back all these private lenders, where whether it's hundred percent finance, or 20% or 80% or RSPs or a personal loan, right? Whichever method you're using, you have to make sure that you know how you're going to exit before you enter the deal. And I was petrified of this before when like when yeah. we started off and we kept talking about it and it helped me, it kept me stuck for a long time because I didn't, I just never, never wanted to use somebody else's money and not being able to pay them back. And I was fearful of that and, and, but we knew we wanted to do it. So we ended up meeting with people from across Canada um, who actually lost their entire portfolio and who were doing the creative financing like we do. And we, we asked them questions, you know, we interviewed them and they were kind enough to speak with us. And in a very quick summary, it all came down to their exit strategy. They didn't have a well-structured exit strategy. And that's what Dave and I, we decided that, okay, you know what, this is what we need to spend our time in and make sure that we have our clear exit strategy each and every single time. And you know, even if there's a great deal, even if it's cash flowing, it doesn't matter. If you don't know how you did exit, you don't enter the deal. Exactly. So all those finance deals that we showed you, if we didn't see the potential to get that lift, to get the appraised higher value, we wouldn't have touched them. There's so many deals, even 100% finance deals that come our way all the time. And if I don't know how I'm going to pay back the, you know, the seller financing or the private lenders, I don't want to touch their money. And that's something like Mel said is so important. A lot of people do this and it's so attractive. You know, it's that kind of tempting, you know, free deal or zero down deal. You don't know how you're going to pay them back. No. Do not touch that money. No, you got to know your exit. Dave and I, we use 100%. our, now we have it down nice and easy. We use our cash flow matrix. We see how the deal is performing on one side and then we see our clear exit strategy or not so clear exit strategy on the other side. And then it becomes Numbers a problem. Don't lie. No, and then, and then we can act, and you need to know your exit. We take our matrix. We go up to Mr. Seller and say, hey, look, this is my exit strategy or Mrs. RSPs. This is how I'm going to pay you back. They can actually take it, show their accountant, and it makes sense because it's it's not just saying, hey, yeah, we're a nice couple. We'll pay you back. That, that's not, you know, that's not good enough. That, that doesn't fly. That yeah. doesn't fly. There's no way we would have bought 12 properties in 12 months if we would have went with that, right? So we knew our exit strategy and we were able to actually rationalize it to the person who we were dealing, doing business with. Absolutely. Saves us so much time yes. now too. You know what deals make sense and which ones don't exactly all right our strategies to success and then we're going to get to about you now our strategies to success so people ask us all the time you know how did you do it how did you grow up quickly how did you buy 12 12 months how did you get over 100 units honestly that massive goal piece at the beginning i'm going to say it again but that was a huge part of it we set massive goals because once you set massive goals then you're forced to take massive action if i would have said i'm only going to buy one property that year probably only would have purchased one property that year, maybe two if I got lucky. But by saying 12 and 12 months, guess what? When I didn't want to get up at five o'clock in the morning and like, well, <laughs> I can't do that two, three nights, two, three mornings in a row, because there's no way I'm going to get to, you know, 12 properties in 12 months if I if I had those goals, right? So it kept us focused. Yeah, and, and, and breaking down the goals, like we had said earlier, the, the, um, the reverse engineering, right? 12 properties in 12 months. Well, what does that look like? Obviously a property a month. You're going to have some deals that some months you won't close. So, and I'm just using ours as an example, but guys, breaking down your goals and reversing engineering, instead of just saying, hey, I want 12 properties, and then where do I go from now? Well, no, make some steps, baby step it, right? Otherwise, you're just going to make it a huge barrier and a huge wall that you're not going to overcome. Uh, power of visualization. This is super powerful. And again, I know some people are going to say, Dave, it's mumbo jumbo. Don't even, you know. Hang up, hang up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exit the webinar. But okay. I'm just, hear me out here, okay? 
if even if you don't believe in it, just try it. What do you have to lose? Just try it out. You know, hear me out here. Just try it out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But if you try visualization, it, it's it, it's going to work. Uh, and then you're going to believe me after. But and visualize, I mean, let's not really think <laughs> of all like woo here. Visualization for us, we had our goal everywhere, right? On, we had it on fridge. We had it in the wash. It was the one I'm brushing my teeth. I had, you know, quit my full-time job. I had take my kids to Disney. I had my Escalade that I drive now. I have the hell that I'm in now, right? All these different things that I wanted for myself. I had these goals. I had the 12 and 12, you know, on my head best in the book. Whatever your goals are, um, you have them on a vision board. And if you look at them every single day, A, it kind of gives you purpose, keeps you motivated, and it, it gives you drive as well. Yeah, and it ends up being that kick in the you-know-what. If you see it, you're like, well, I don't have that yet. Instead of getting bummed out, okay, what am I doing today to, to get that? So power visualization, try it out. Uh, it's super powerful stuff. What's well, super funny is I'm kind of saying a story here that <laughs> I wasn't expecting to say. What's super funny is that when uh, when people came over at our house at first and you would see our vision board, we started doing this, or, you know, you'd be like, you know, what are you guys doing? And look at that house. And, you know, and meanwhile, we live in like a little house. And, oh, you really want to quit your job? And, and all of a sudden, you know, they saw everything starting to happen throughout the years, right? It was, we're not an overnight success. It didn't happen overnight, but people started saying, like, wait a second, they got the house that was on the vision board. And, not quit her full-time job and they're going to Disney again and all these different things uh, that we were able to do. So power visualization, of course, um, as well as, as as actually doing it, right? Absolutely. NASA even does it, eh? For the yes, yes. Investing in yourself. Of course we invested in ourselves. People say, did exactly. you guys do this all by yourself? I'd love to take credit for it, but I can't, right? Uh, of course we invested in ourselves um, and we continue to invest in ourselves. So we spent over $100,000 in our own learning, we're continuing to do so. You know, we enrolled in the program that long ago. You know, we're always continuing yeah, to grow and learn. It's huge, huge, huge. Um, and I'm, I think that it, it comes down to there's always two ways, right? You can you can go like this and take your time going at it, or you can invest in yourself and you know grow much quicker and reduce the amount of huge mistakes that you would make, right? Yeah. Uh, Turning you know decades into into a lot shorter period is, is decades, powerful, right? Months, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Last one, massive action, guys. Okay, this is so true. You have to take massive action. You know, once you understand how to do things, and once you have that base, you need to get out there and get it right. Go out uh, and, and well, sorry, apply the knowledge that you have, um, and that's truly what. We find some people again, like we we're saying earlier, that has to be everything. You have to have the knowledge and the uh, the massive action. So once you have that knowledge base and the massive action, again, you're limitless. Like one of our first slides. Yes. Now let's go back to you. We're going to be in your face. You. It's all about you. We're going to be in your face here a little bit. So there's only one barrier to your success, and it's you. And it really, truly, is you. Dave and I were not any different than you are. Um, you know, we don't come from a rich family. We didn't have any special tools or special connections or anything. We weren't handed a portfolio. No, we, you know, <laughs> we, we made a lot of mistakes. Um, we certainly never gave up. We set some goals. We invested in ourselves. And, uh, and then we were able to achieve success, right? So I want to ask you and be honest with yourself here. And you don't have to write it down in the chat unless you want to share it with everyone. <laughs> but you don't have to. Um, what is, you know, what's your barrier? What is stopping you? And, and, and be honest with yourself. You spent about an hour or so with us um, tonight. What is stopping you to succeed? Is it, you know, what excuse are you making? Are you making an excuse that, well, I don't have any money? Well, we're showing you how to buy properties without, you know, none of your own money. Are you, is it that I don't have time? Again, we did it. You do have time. You might have to give it up. You might have to give up your free TV, your favorite TV show in order to build it, right? And it's, it's long term, or what's it uh, that saying? Yeah. Generational wealth? No, short term. Oh, uh, short term pain for long term gain. Yeah, yeah, right. It's true. Doing what you don't want to do today to be able to do whatever you want tomorrow. That's so true. The other thing too, please, guys, do not let the market thing be be your barrier. We that's again one of the biggest things we hear. Don't let the market be an issue. There are deals everywhere. This works everywhere. Creative. I'm looking to buy a place in Florida. I'm finding creative financing there. Like you know, I've uh, guys, it's everywhere. And truly don't let that be a barrier for you. Yes. So if you take anything from our session today, you can absolutely do this. You just need, you may just need something, right? You may need the knowledge. 
or you may need to take action, or you may need a combination of both, right? Whatever it is, you need to start doing something if you want to change your life. And you obviously got on this webinar tonight to do something different. And I hope that some of the tips you'll be able to take and expand on that as well. And we have a very exciting um, opportunity for you here tonight. Uh, we are giving away $5,000. So $5,000, $1,000 to the first five people who sign up to our lifetime access mentoring program. So it's going to be $1,000 off. Um, it's a unique opportunity that where, you know, uh, Dave was kind enough to, to let us uh, give you an opportunity with everything going on. We decided to, hey, you know what, let's give the opportunity to five lucky participants tonight to, uh, to join a mentoring program. I'm not going to go into details here about the mentoring program. I'll, I'll talk 20 seconds and then I'll get into the Q and A's yeah. um, if you're fine with that. But basically it's two things. There's a online portion where you get over 120 videos with everything you need to know, right? How to structure, how to find deals, how to use other people's money, your business structure, how to, you know, interest rates to pay, property management, all that kind of stuff, but all in the online courses. And then you get lifetime access to Dave and I in a private Facebook group. You get to ask us unlimited amount of questions. We are so, so active with our mentees. Awesome. And that's why we have such amazing testimonials is because um, I think we are very unique. You know, it's not an eight-week session where we're saying, hey, 12 weeks later, good luck. <laughs> right? We get to know. <laughs> let us know how it goes. Yeah, let us know how it goes. No, because guess what? You're going to hit different roadblocks as you progress. So, yeah. So book a call with us. The link is below. You can see it there. Um, you can type it out. And you have to type it out just so you know as a heads up. It has to be as is. If you try to do the www, it's not going to generate. So if you're copying it, make sure to copy it as, as such. Yeah, and I'll just touch on this briefly again, guys, and we'll get to the q and I know uh, that, that's usually our favorite part of the night. Um, again, lifetime access. It's not, you know, you get lifetime access to the online courses. You get lifetime access to us. We answer questions within 24 hours. You go on the Facebook group, you ask a question, the other mentees start hopping in. It's awesome, and then it compounds on itself. Um, the other thing as well I was going to say is, you know, it's A to Z. It's not just how to find deals. After that, how do you deal with the assets? How do you deal with refinances? Should you sell? Should you flip? Should you refinance? Um, the other part I wanted to mention, uh, oh, we don't hold anything back. It's not like, you know, all the knowledge that we have and all the experiences are in the course, in the mentoring, guys. You truly get 100% of our experiences and everything that we do. Yeah, and there's so much more. I mean, we could talk for hours, so book a call and we can tell you all about <laughs> it. There. But yeah, I mean, there's uh, we go live with our mentees every single week for an hour. Yeah. There's another group where we people post different deals that you have off-market deals. You can have access to some really hot deals. We post deals we ourselves. Post deals sometimes deals that, that we can't close on. sometimes, yeah. Like there's a triplex the other day that great deal, nothing nothing really to do. It's going to appreciate from 235 to 315. Uh, the rents just need to go up. So one of our mentees got that deal. Great deal. We couldn't yeah. close it because we have four at the bank and they said, okay. Hang on, let's find the face one. Awesome. So yeah, so book a call. Um, our mentorship uh, manager will, will tell you all about the program. And uh, yeah, we look forward to hopefully having some of you taking advantage of this awesome opportunity. Yeah. Great. So, let's do some so Q&A's, Dave. Some Q &A, Dave. All right, you guys. Good job. So hey, everybody, to make it easier, I just copied and pasted that link into the chat box, also into the question box. So just click directly on that. Try, don't try to remember that big, long, ugly thing. Just, <laughs> just click directly on the link in the chat box or in the question box. And we've got quite a few questions that have come in. I think you guys covered some of it, but we're gonna, we're gonna jump right into these questions. I'm gonna ask them anyhow, you guys, just so you can reiterate and, and, and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, so somebody's asking, Ian's asking, do you personally have to qualify for the first mortgage? So that came on early in the call. He went over it, but just quickly go over how you're not having to personally qualify for these for these mortgages. Yeah, great question, Ian. And okay, so I'll kind of go two quick scenarios here. Uh, if you're in a corporation or if you're not in a corporation, and also because that's going to, you know, that's going to dictate. And then also, is it a four unit and under, which is considered residential, uh, or is it a five unit and over, which is considered commercial? So the commercial, everyone says, you know, you don't need to qualify. It's strictly the building that qualifies. Uh, in our experience, yes, they, they, they mostly look at the asset itself. 
they look at is it sustainable or the ratio is met you know what is the state of the asset however you know even if you buy uh, a fiveplex and over in a corporation they're going to look at that you're still going to have to qualify they still look at you you know they're still going to look at you to qualify you're going to have to guarantee the debt right you're going to have to uh, personally guarantee the corporation's debt um, so they still end up looking at you on the residential side they look a little more at you uh, uh, they look at the asset as well um, but yeah you're still qualifying for the mortgage on both sides uh, it's just a little again in our experience it, they're still going to pull your credit um, but yeah it's just a little different on the res and the commercial yes and just to add to that um, and that's a great question because we often get asked well I have zero money I don't have any credit I, have, I don't have credit card you know but I want to buy properties and you know, should I do it? And honestly, right, if that's the situation that you're in, no, not right now. You do need, to, and again, I'm saying this because I want to set you up for success. You do need some liquid cash. So yes, we show people how to buy properties using none of their own money. However, you still need some money to pay for things such as lawyers or deposit or what happens if a tenant doesn't pay rent for a month or two or if there's unforeseen maintenance, right? So you do need that, that backup. And that's why we love creative financing because we have our line of credit. If ever we need to dip into it, we will, because it's always there. Since we're never using our own money, right? So we always have that to buy it, right? So it's always there as a backup. No, great point. And 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 Ian, look at the example number three, right? There's no bank. I didn't have to qualify for anything. The owner held the mortgage. Mrs. RSB held the down payment. So there was no qualifying there. Yeah. That's tough. So Teresa asks, what is your procedure for removing tenants in order to raise the rents? What's the time frame from purchase to refinancing? Yeah, and, and great question, Teresa. And again, and again it's gonna, I, I hate when people give me this answer, but it's, it's gonna, gonna be, depend. It's gonna, it's gonna depend, one of those, but yeah. that's the reality. It, it truly does vary. Yeah, and again, we do everything legal, above board. You know, We don't play any of those games. Uh, so we show different ways uh, how to get people out. We show win-win situations, right? How do you benefit from it? How does the tenant benefit from it? Why should they move, right? So there's lots of different ways to do that. Now the timeline being, uh, it depends. Like sometimes you'll buy a place and you know there'll be uh, one unit has uh, students in it, so you know they're going to be gone May. Uh, sometimes you know you have tenants where, and, and this is where we work with them. Hey, you know how are things here? We have other units, or I noticed you have a pet here. There's not much of a backyard. I've got a place coming up with a backyard, you know, it might be a little bit more expensive, but it's going to suit your life. So there's so many ways to work at that. Now, honestly, when I'm buying a building and I know that that's what needs to happen is the tenants, I'll probably give myself a cushion of two years, if, if not, maybe three. Um, like the, like the first example, the sixplex, uh, we bought that in 2017 and we refinanced it not long ago. So that, you know, we could have refinanced it last October, but by the time CMHC and everything. So, it took us about two years to get uh, turnovers. And there'll be some buildings where, you know, bing, bang, boom, and all of a sudden a bunch of people move out. So yeah, you for it, sure always want to have that have buffer, that right? We always have, and if it's a flip, sometimes we'll do a, like a flip to sell type thing, a quick flip, um, you know, okay, we could probably flip it in four months, but we're never going to just ask for six months, right? We're always like, what if something happens? What if it, we need, you know, um, I don't know, uh, things from the city, and uh, it takes longer because, well, people aren't working or they're on vacation or whatever happens, right? So we always, always give ourselves a, a question. Good, so we got a couple of questions that are similar. Uh, how much time between closing, uh, getting rid of your low rental tenants, reno and refinancing, and then also, yeah, what's the timeline of the deal? How do you pay out? When do you pay out the seller? Yeah, great question. And our quickest one, uh, refinance I've ever done was six months. Um, sometimes you'll buy a building that's so underperforming, but yet the the purchase price is still different than what the actual value is, right? So the quickest refinance I've done is six months where uh, the seller just wanted out, they were done, their spouse was done with it, and he said, you know, hey Dave, save my marriage, <laughs> basically. Right time, so, right, right time, right, right yeah, place, and they the held, yeah, right? <laughs> they held the mortgage, and uh, the appraisal came in higher than the purchase price, um and i i thought i talked to the uh the financial institution i said okay let's 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 refinance this right away and they said no no it's not the way it works the underwriters wanted me to wait at least six to eight months then they're becoming eight let's sorry it wasn't six months sorry uh they told me to wait six months but by the time holidays came in i think it was like in december and all that so it ended up being somewhere around eight months by the time people got back to the swing of things um 
but yeah, the underwriters wanted to wait because they said it's going to look bad if you purchase it and then pull them right away. Um, so that one was that. Now the other sequence of events, realistically, uh, depending if it's it, like I'm thinking, we buy bank repos sometimes. Um, we we renovate them, and then as soon as we renovate it and we have the units full with tenants at market rent, boom, we're ready to refine it. So that that one is the sequence of events there. When you buy a building like like look the one on Cedar there, the sixplex initially. The sequence of events, we got into it, we had to wait for the tenants to move, to change over. So that was a two year process, but literally the refinance can happen as soon as your building is either renovated, if that was your why you bought it, or your rents have come up. Um, like think of the, uh, the 17 unit building, an example too. There's still a lift to happen. Not, not all 17 units are up, but I knew, I did my calculation and my cash flow analysis matrix, I knew that okay, there's enough of a lift, there's enough of a higher rent that I know I can get my appraisal high enough where I can pay out uh, mortgage number one and, and um, uh, seller financing number two. So I waited long enough for that. Now, now it's fully mine, you know, there's no other mortgages. So now I'll wait for the rents to go up again. So yeah. And that's so powerful as well. Like, so the 12 we bought in 12 months, we're all repaid in two to three years as opposed to um, the five years. One of them was a seven-year term. We paid yeah, that. that's right. So <laughs> even sooner than that. Um, but think how powerful that is. So all of a sudden, we pay them back early. They're like, "Wow, that's amazing! You paid me back." The trust just went. I mean, they obviously like been trusted from the beginning, but they saw that we, you know, make our payments every single month. We paid them back between four and and uh, you know four. Yeah, I guess four years and or uh, some of them four years, some of them two three years early. And, uh, and all of a sudden they're saying, okay, well, I have, let's say $250,000 back. I don't need it right away. Hey, let's do it all over again. Either I have another place to sell or, you know, th th maybe this time I'm going to become private seller, right? Or private, uh, private lender. Yeah. yeah. So it ends up being, uh, it can, it's just a true win, win, they win, we win, everybody wins. All right, you guys. Um, so lots of questions about financing. What financial institution do you use? Do they allow you to own more than five doors? Uh, you know, the, the questions about how's the bank uh, allowing you to use the private lender or VTB as a second and, and, and without any money from your pocket. You guys touched on this, but it was a really important point that a lot of people didn't quite clue in on is that you're not typically dealing with the big five banks when you're initially getting into the property. So maybe just re-explain yeah. that again quickly. Yeah, for sure. And, and I like to, uh, when I discuss this, I always call it kind of like the life cycle of the deal. Okay. Um, so we used to deal exclusively with Scotiabank and, uh, well not exclusively, but we, we, at one point we got up to 10 buildings and we wanted to have another one from them. And they said, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you have 10 buildings. And so what do you mean? My ratios are great, the income, the cash flow. And they said, head office in Toronto says, once you have 10, you're done. Like, okay. <laughs> okay about it. That doesn't make any sense, but policy. okay. So yeah, we weren't happy that day, but. <laughs> yeah, so Scotia, again, we did hit the wall with the big five. Um, now the credit unions we use, so different credit unions and Google credit union, there's there's one close to you in Canada, right? And then they all have different, uh, uh, different rules, regulations. They also are, they have different mandates, right? Like they don't have all the th same things that the, the big five have with the federal regulations. I'm not saying that it's the wild west here, but again, it's more of a uh, in-branch, in-house decision, uh, case by case, that type of thing. So that's how we're, we're able to do that. Again, mortgage brokers as well. Sometimes they'll give us a mortgage. They found a private lender. They're, they're doing the mortgage through that. So that's a beautiful thing as well. Now the life cycle of the deal, what I'm getting at is like, let's take, um, well, let's, let's take the two first deals we saw. Okay. So that the credit union gave me a first mortgage, the owners held the second mortgage and the credit union was okay with that. Cause I still met my ratios and they saw my exit strategy and then boom, we upped the value. We forced appreciation. The appraisal comes in. We brought it to uh, first national, which is a, an A lender first national gave us uh, CMHC financing as well. And again, guys, CMH, CMHC financing, we've been working on it since last July. They just refinanced during COVID. 
four million dollars, right? So obviously they're okay with our portfolio because we have other deals that are still 100% financed that haven't come to fruition yet. So again, once the deal comes to fruition, we said, hey, you know, hey, a lender, we want to bring these these uh, deals to you, and they're okay with it because they say they saw, okay, you have secondary financing. I give you a new first mortgage. I pay out your secondary financing, which is allowable in their rules, right? Because there is no mm -hmm. second mortgage. And then those other ones, again, cycle of the deal or the life cycle of the deal. Yeah, every institution, every um, uh, credit union, every private lender, every mortgage broker, they all have a place in the deals. Yes, and we'll often hear, um, well, okay, yeah, but you pay higher interest than you know, somebody else will. And okay, yes, I might pay a couple thousand dollars, let's say extra, let's say a couple thousand dollars extra a year, but did you not see the lift that I got off these properties? And that was with none of our own money and I was able to buy so many properties because of this. So yes, I'm okay paying a little bit higher interest as long as of course the deal makes sense and it's sustainable and I have my exit strategy and all the strategies are in place um, because it's always bigger picture, bigger picture. Yes, I, I have to pay a bit more interest, but it's either that or use my own money or and then I can only buy one, <laughs> you know, one every few years, right? So it, yeah. it's just, it's not even comparable. It's just, again, it's, it's the excuse sometimes people make, well, I don't want to pay higher interest rate. Well, that's fine, but you're also probably not going to be able to own a lot of properties pretty quickly if you're not open to doing that. And again, I'm not saying hey, crazy. So I'm not <laughs> saying, you know, you got to do your due diligence. You got to make sure the deal makes sense, all that. Do your due diligence, of course. Um, but that's how we think. We always think bigger picture. Does it make sense? Is there a huge lift? Do we have our exit strategy? And and if so, then it might cost it's more, but what's the end result? Exactly. Yeah. So you guys, a couple of people asking you, where are, where and how are you finding your deals? Yeah, and our portfolio is mostly in North Bay, Ontario. Um, and again, we have, we have a bunch of different creative strategies that we use. Uh, and, and it's just, it, it's approaching the, it's approaching the potential seller in a way where they weren't even thinking of selling, right? And you're getting ahead of it to find those off-market deals. The other thing too is we use we use realtors throughout uh, Canada as well. Um, sorry, real estate investor focused realtors that understand cash flow analysis, understand how to uh, how to find the, these deals. We use them. A lot of them will send us pocket deals. They'll send us on-market deals that you know. Like, like this one was on the market for 10 months. People just, they didn't see the potential. They saw through it, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that answers your question, Dave. Yeah. Um, so Ray's asking, how are you able to increase re rent, especially in the COVID-19 era? Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, like uh, for the month, what are we, April? So for the month of April, if we had any rent increases, obviously we didn't do it this month. That would be tasteless, right? Yeah, and honestly as well, um, that's not really, I mean, that would, we live in Ontario. So for us, I'm not sure where you're from. For us here in Ontario, you can't just raise the rents. Um, there's various strict regulations. You can only, it's a very small percentage every 12 months. So it, that's now how we raise rents, right? It, it is, I mean, we have a lot of different strategies. Um, but of course, one of them is just when, when natu naturally, when a tenant moves out, then if it's underperforming, then we would make, put it up again to market value. Yeah, and to touch on Ray's, uh, just to different provinces, different uh, procedures. So yeah, in Ontario, so May 1st, I think our director told us there's eight units flipping or, or changing of hands. Um, that's on a Friday. I was, I was happy to hear it's not on a weekend. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so eight units are switching or changing hands. Now in Ontario, as soon as the unit becomes vacant or you know up for rent, that's how we can put it up to market rent, right? So that's that's an easy way of getting market rent without uh, you know doing it and giving someone a rent increase during during COVID. Now the other thing too is that we have mentees throughout Canada, right? So um, some of our mentees in New Brunswick tell us that you can raise it. I think it's once a year to there's but there's no there's no amount. Yeah. And again, don't quote me on this, guys. I'm going by someone by third party info. But something that you can increase it um, once a year to, but there's no like here in Ontario is 2.2%. Uh, so New Brunswick seems to have a little bit more lax uh, landlord regulations for that. I know Alberta has a little bit more towards the landlord uh, pendulum is a little bit more on that side as well with with different things. And I think BC where you are, Dave, is kind of like Ontario where it's a little bit more towards the tenant side. But you yeah. know, you, there, there's rules and you have to play within them. But um, yeah, so we get rents legally up. 
and oh, the other one was Quebec. I know Quebec. Our mentees, we have a lot in Montreal. Um, there's a certain ratio. Like, let's say your tenant moves out. And again, guys, I'm not pretending to be the expert on this. I'm just going by what we have with the um, uh, with our mentees. So in Quebec, let's say a tenant moves out. There's actually, you're supposed to show the new tenant what the old tenant was paying if they asked for it. And then there's like a grade. Like, let's say I did nothing to the unit and I'm saying, hey, I want a thousand bucks more a month. They can call the let's say the landlord tenant board like they can't just do that unless you put substantial amount of renovations into it. So different provinces have different rules, uh, Ray. And again, it's just finding how you're gonna how you're gonna navigate those waters. But there's always a way to do it legally um, and, and, and ethically. So another big question that's coming up is, what are you typically paying for interest rates for your first and second mortgages? whether it's with your investors, RSP investors, the owners that are financing the properties for you, what's what's kind of the range? Obviously it's all negotiable, but give or take. Yeah, honestly, it's it's negotiable, but again, it's, it's not really a, this is what you should ask, right? It, it really is a, a broad answer. How long is the term for? Um, are they, is it a promissory note? Is it RSPs? Is it a owner financing? There's so many, you know, there's so many different aspects. Is it perhaps somebody that we've been doing business with for a couple of years and I know that we can basically recycle their money and it's easy and you know they're low maintenance and right so there's so many different ways um I know it's kind of a great answer but it's really, it really what's, what's the what's the what's the lowest you paid what's the most you paid how about that yeah no fair enough the lowest we paid is three percent uh, and that's with non-financial um uh, uh, like non uh, like with uh, with a non-financial institution yeah 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 and well, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to put out what we pay the highest on, <laughs> on the internet. So <laughs> the only thing I'm going to say is, if the deal makes sense and the deal can support it, you know, our philosophy is, hey, if you tell me, Dave, uh, you got to pay me a million bucks, and in the end, you're going to get five million, I'm going to do it all day, every day. Exactly. Right? It's a slam if the deal makes sense <laughs> and I'm going to make a whole lot of money, then I'm open for discussion. All right, so. Barbara, you got some kind of nitpicky questions here. I suggest you book a call with these guys, have a conversation <laughs> directly. Um, so you guys up on the screen, I don't know, Dave and Mel, are you able to see? I think I'm sharing my screen, I hope. And that's... We don't no, I, we, don't, we don't see you still. Not, not able, well, no, are you able to see the screen? Are you able to see what I'm showing? No. I still see myself pointing up. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, so I, I am able to see the screen. So I think everybody can see it. When you click on the link, that's where it's going to take you to. So just fill out that quick little questionnaire. And then at the bottom, click on submit. And that'll take you to Mel and Dave's calendar, where you pick the day and the time where you'd like to have a chat with them. See if working together with Mel and Dave makes sense for you. Uh, in my mind, it sure as heck does. I mean, these guys <laughs> are doing exactly what you came on this webinar to learn about. They're knee deep in it. This is what they do all day long, they're full-time real estate entrepreneurs. They have exited the, the rat race. They have created the North American dream through real estate investing. So, um, you know, just, you can tell just by what they've shared with us here tonight, these, these folks definitely know what they're talking about and they're nice people too. <laughs> it's really nice. So, I mean, again, if you're at all interested, you guys, book a call, see if it makes sense for you. I think you're saying the first five people get a thousand bucks off each or if they decide to move ahead with your program so that's an awesome deal you guys we've got still got some more questions i just want to get that out there uh so so people aren't procrastinating on that um <laughs> but, but, but now, so we found out about the interest rates so so mel how do the how does the bank qualifying work for refinance what are the requirements the bank is looking for when you're refinancing the property so sorry, what's the question? What what's the bank looking for when you want to refinance the property? Well, they're essentially going to look at look at the the numbers again, right? So they're going to have the uh, they're going to need an appraiser, um, and often you're not the one that's going to choose the appraiser. So no, we don't have special appraisers. They we all, heard that too. Yeah, we hear people say, "Oh, you guys must be friends with an appraiser." No, we don't get to pick them. That's a, that's a question that just came up. Yep. Okay, Lenders have their own appraisers. Can you choose your appraiser for refinancing? No. No. And no. <laughs> no, we've heard it all, right? We've heard how did you how did you get you know did you make a side deal with the seller to get it so low? 
Did you use an appraiser and bribe them? Did you make a deal at the bank? Like, it's like, no, no, this is legitimate. We're not, we're not greasing everyone's hand to get everyone hands to get. So well, Dave, I was just kind of wondering to encourage people to leave. Do you show up, you know, in a, in a tank top and a scowl and cut, because you look like a pretty big guy. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> yeah. Intimidate a few people out of the, out of the. Yeah, I know. I play the opposite. Uh, sweet as pie. I show up like this. I show up with my blazer. I show up with a golf uh, golf shirt, uh, and I show up with some numbers, right, to show them that hey, I've done my research on this. I've done my math, and and that's the thing. Like Mel said, the banks choose, or the financial institution, the credit unions, whatever, they choose the appraisers. So. And they dictate what uh, the appraiser needs to kind of do, right? Like I've talked to appraisers before and they said different banks have different criteria, have different uh, specs. Um, now that being said, again, every, usually when you're, when they're going into it, there's three different ways that they're going to look at the property. They're going to look at, um, what is it? They're going to look at the com uh, comparisons, the comps, right? What have other properties sold for, you know, with this type of, it's a triplex, what have other triplexes sold for? Uh, which always kind of drives me a little bonkers because I'm like, well, my rents are so much higher. My expenses are so much lower. You can't compare apples and oranges. So that's one way of looking at it. Then my favorite is they also use the income approach because that's where we shine. Like, Hey, look, if the rents are at market. If not better, we've brought down the expenses. So the income approach is awesome. And then they also look at the, um, uh, I forget what the wording is, but basically the cost of the replacement cost. What is the replacement cost of this thing? you know, comes crumbling down to the ground, how much is it going to cost? So again, the appraisals, uh, that's what they go on is three things like that. Um, and then they come to, to a, a market analysis and it's, it's, it's truly math, right? Like it, it's not like you can just tell the appraiser, give me this number because uh, like Dave said, I showed up in a tank top and I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> or 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 Mel was angry. One of the two. Who knows, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, so we got some questions here. Mark asks, "How do you raise rent above Ontario guidelines on long-term tenants, uh, ten plus years, who do not want to pay more rent for improving their unit?" So, do you have any tricks for getting long-term tenants the hell out, or to pay higher rent? I don't think so. That's not what they've been talking about, Mark. It's about uh, well encouraging people to to move out. Uh, legally, without intimidation, etc. But do you have any? Uh, Again, any there's there, there's ways, right? If they've been there for ten or eighteen years, uh, there's going to be things that they don't like about the apartment. Honestly, one of the things is coming about it in a non-negative way. Like if you're a new landlord, you bought the building. They know they they know you want them out. They know you want market rent, right? So. Um, things we've done in the past without going too much into detail is make it a win-win. You know, if they're a good tenant, they pay that type of thing. What are you looking for? What, you know, what can you, again, I'm an investor and usually we have our, our directors say this so that it's not directly us, right? Or serve property management. Um, but, uh, what was I going to say? Like, what, how can we help you, uh, to enjoy your place better? You know, are there any little upgrades or things like that? But, it has to be a win-win because otherwise they know they can stay there forever and your 2.2% per, per year, it's going to be the, the best you can do. Yeah. Um, Monica's asking, how do you research the area when it's not in your backyard? How much do you need to know about an area before you invest in it? Yeah. yeah. And again, that, that's what we tell people. It doesn't need to be in your backyard. If you're open to that, right? Uh, and again, different places have different things like the, the hotter markets, let's say, you know, we have mentees that tell us, you know, I, I bought this building here uh, this year and then next year it's worth X amount more. And I literally did nothing. And yeah, I think in having a network, right? Like we have our, and I'm thinking of our own circle, right? Our own uh, inner circle with uh, our mentees. Like we have people from New Brunswick who are dealing, doing deals with people from Toronto, who do deals with people from Quebec and, and right. So they have all these network already, everything's set up. They know who to contact. They can ask them questions. They can get them for property management. So, Having a network, your network is your network, right? So um, obviously you have to do your research and the internet is a great thing and there's so many you know, tips and tricks and you can literally talk about this for hours, um, but also making sure that you have a, a strong network in place so that way, you know, when you have a question, when you can, you, can, you have people to reach out to as well. 
So Ray's got a good question. How do you assess the value of a small multifamily property? So for example, a duplex, triplex, fourplex under commercial you know, level in small towns with little to no comparables? Yeah, and that's where the cash flow analysis major comes in. Um, and you're gonna rely heavily on the professionals in that area to, to let you know uh, what different aspects that you're going to need to complete. Like, again, I'm just talking about how well we do, right? Yeah, because we look everywhere. We're looking at places across Canada. Some are hot markets, some are secondary markets, some are extremely quiet markets. <laughs> yeah, like this, I'm thinking of one in BC where there's a couple in northern BC and there's one, I, think it's, I, know, I can see it on the, on, the, on the map, but I'm trying to look at comps, trying to look at things. And, and again, I need certain... Um, you know specs to to be able to fill in my cash analysis matrix to see hey where is this deal right now and where is it going but the comps don't get too caught up on the comps is what i'm going to say talk to the professionals in that area in that market that are doing real estate ask them what you should be you know what what can you expect for you know whatever you're looking for in the deal uh because again they're living and breathing it right in, in that area um uh, somebody asked where are you guys based where do where do you guys live what city do you live in? Yeah, so we live in North Bay, Ontario, which is about uh, three hours north of Toronto. All right, perfect. Um, if you're investing in a different province, how do you know, how do you find a good property management company to manage your properties? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we, we have our own property management company here in our city, so we've seen it all. I mean, we've been doing it for years. So we, we essentially use everything, all the systems, all the strategies that we've implemented in our own business. And we make sure that whoever we're going to be dealing with elsewhere have the same kind of high level, you know, um, I guess, expectation and standards and procedures, because we see it all the time. People, you know, will come in and, and you know, we'll ask them, you know, to manage for people across Canada. They have properties across Canada and we'll have discussions with them or director will and and you know he'll often tell us like i can't believe they were never did this or they've never done that and it's like oh my gosh so it's just really you know take your time do your due diligence ask a lot of questions yes. again your network your network is your net worth right i have people i mean in our mentoring group we have people from across canada i can call any or i can you know put on the, our private facebook page and say i need this information and somebody's gonna jump and reply the same day because i have all these connections so get to know people who are real estate investors themselves, successful real estate investors, right? And the one thing I'm gonna say is just remember, once you hire that company, again, um, it's not like you're, uh, uh, it's not like you've washed your hands mm -hmm. away uh, of responsibility and all right. that. So just remember, they truly are an extension of you, so. It's okay to ask them questions. I mean, and they should be providing you with information. Like we give, we give so much, we have, we have our the way we're, our system is set up. They can actually log in and see numbers themselves. Like we provide them, with, you want to make sure that you're set up for success because it really is your property. And yes, even if you want to be you know hands off, you still should have an idea. Even if you're not the one you know going to the building, um, you should still know what's happening with your property. So we you got know, a couple of questions that are similar here, you guys, about what lift is again. So. So Monarch is asking, what is our lift again? And, and David's asking, so when you raise the rents, how does the property get revalued? So those are kind of connected there. How, how you're increasing the value of the property so quickly. Yeah, and uh, so the lift, that, that's kind of like our terminology. So your lift is basically, and I'll use the first example, okay? So the lift is, it's the difference. So I bought it for 575, I did what I had to do, and now it was at, I think, 840. So that gap here is the lift. You brought the property from 575 to 840. So you lifted the, the value. That's what we call the lift. Um, and, and that's truly, yeah. So what do you buy it for? What is it appraised for today? That difference, you've just created income there. You've just created a lift in valuation. And I kind of want to touch on the rent because that seems to be coming up. In, and I just want to make it clear that that's one strategy of many strategies. And again, you could literally talk about old strategies for, for hours, but... Um, yes, sometimes it's rent. Sometimes it's a combination of different things. Sometimes it's a complete get job. Like there's a lot of different ways that you can be finding this forced appreciation or this lift that we refer to. Sometimes the rents are, you know, decent, um, but the but the property is, is is old. It's rough. It needs a facelift, right? So as long as and you know, a lot of us we know it as the perverse strategy or flip to self strategy. So 
we do all of the above. So it's not necessarily only rent here. There's a lot of different strategies that you can use and that we've used. It's not always yeah. rent. Um, sometimes it is a good job. We have a triplex right now that you know it it was a uh, bank repo. We bought it for a hundred uh, twenty or something. One fourteen. One fourteen. He's the numbers guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I round off. Uh, so one twenty ish and uh, underperforming. I mean, we we jump on it right away, of course, and we're gonna have a huge slip. But yes, we had to put money into it. Um, we used other people's money, though. We didn't use a penny to buy it or a penny to do the renovations. And we still are going to get that huge lift. So again, there's just a lot of different ways. I just want you to stay open-minded. It's not just, yeah, this not just one. Things. There's so many ways we can do this. Yeah, and in the in the uh, the mentoring course, we literally have a section on on renovations where we show you the countertops we use, we show you the paint, we show you the you know how to do a bathroom. So it, it, again, if the less money you put into it, and the more you can get out, it, again, it, it's the lift, right? And then also. Um, what you can do to save on expenses, different things like that, guys. Uh, from our 17 plus years combined experience, again, it's it's not it's tried and true stuff, right? There's always <laughs> tricks, right? <laughs> so Kim, uh, they just mentioned what what that is. Uh, Kim's also saying you mentioned exit strategy. Do you mean keeping it as a rental property is a good exit, or to sell them? So I think what it's a little bit different what you guys are talking about. Yeah, great question. So exit, so we don't sell. I mean, we've sold a couple, but our strategy is buy and hold. So we buy it, we flip it. What I'm referring to with, or what we're referring to with exit strategy is how are we going to pay back the private lenders? So that let's say the 20% down or 25% um, using the service fees or owner financing or private money. How are we going to pay them back before the term is up? So if we don't know how we're going to do that, how we don't exit essentially, um, how we pay them back before the term is up, then we walk away. So that's what we refer to. But no, it's still, we're not selling it. Uh, we're keeping all the properties that we have. That's the beauty of it. It's, it's a generational wealth, right? We get to grow our portfolio and keep it, pay them back, and then basically use their money again and redo it all over again and keep growing our portfolio. And that's how it becomes limitless, right? We talked about being limitless. This is how you can be limitless. There's no stopping. You can, it's not something you can do one and then, you know, because that's what I hated when we got stuck we couldn't buy any properties anymore because we didn't have any money. We literally, like I was working at the college and I started working, I started teaching on top of working at the college full time. I was trading my time for money instead of, oh my, you know, and then finally we discovered the power of creative financing and wait a second, let's stop changing, exchanging our, our time for money and let's start putting our money to work. Somebody else's money <laughs> working that makes us money. All right, good, you guys. We're gonna wrap things up now to respect everybody's time. Mel and Dave, thank you so much. Uh, Ray, I suggest book a call with these guys because <laughs> you, you got lots of questions there, buddy. <laughs> book a call with these guys, get them answered. Um, fantastic, fantastic information, you guys. Really appreciate it. And yeah, any last words as we wrap things up? Yeah, just again, guys, thank you so much. I see the, the number of attendees. It shows you guys are serious about real estate. Thank you so much for staying to the end. Appreciate it. Uh, again, guys, like we had talked about, don't let this COVID thing, you know, uh, there's lots of time to be spent right now. I wouldn't, please don't waste it. Better yourself. You want to come out of the COVID saying, hey, I did this and this during it, and you want to be slingshot. You want to, boom, be ready to go when all this is, you know, this too shall pass. Yes, and I, I would like to, uh, you know, I always think back of what Tony Robbins told us, and, you know, the whole, he used to make $340 a week or so, and, uh, and then before he uh, he wanted to grow and he wanted to learn and he wanted to expand and his buddy told him, you know, you have to go to this conference and it, it was $340. Like, hey buddy, like that's what I make in a week and you want me to spend all that in, in two hours. And you know, how can you do it? But he took it, he took a leap of faith, he invested in himself and he grew. And, and that's what we've done. And that's what every successful person I know has ever done is, is you know, invest in themselves, fast forward the growth, reduce the amount of errors you know the return on investment with with uh, a mentorship program is 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 endless um because you'll continue to get that return on time so you know if this is something that you're serious about if you're ready to take action now we're all about action takers yes. um that's who we want in our program if you're ready to change your life you're ready to take that you know change take put our strategies our systems 
use all our strategies, use our cash flow matrix, change your life, book a call with us. We'll get into the detail of the mentorship program with you. And, uh, and most importantly, you know, just keep learning, keep expanding. Good stuff. Thank you guys very much. Really appreciate yeah. it. It was a lot of fun. I took notes. Uh, good stuff. Congratulations. Hats off to everything that you guys have accomplished. And uh, big hats off to how tight you guys are as a family and as a team. Because I, I tell you, it is so wonderful when you're able to work together as spouses and and be so successful and obviously, <laughs> no, and obviously love each other as much as you guys do. So hats off to you. Awesome, for all the dude. success you have in all the different areas of your lives. Oh, well, Amazing. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dave. Thank very you. Kind thank words. you. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for staying this yes. entire time. Great question. Thanks for hosting this, Dave. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you, Dave. My pleasure. All right, everybody. Take care. God bless. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.